The Singlet Institute pursues basic scientific research on the questions surrounding friendly AI, whether friendly AI can be created. SIAI is about looking ahead and trying to think deliberately about, even though things are way in the future, the future will come faster than anybody knows, looking ahead and saying, what are the issues we need to worry about now? Maybe there's some things we need to prepare for those issues, or maybe there's ways we need to design these artificial intelligence systems to take account so there'll be the right kinds of AI in the future instead of potentially the wrong kinds of AI. There's no other nonprofit that asks the questions, how do we determine whether what we call friendly AI is in fact viable? And it's a profoundly complex question. The Singularity Institute was founded on the theory that in order to get a friendly artificial intelligence, someone's got to build one. So there, we're just going to have an organization whose mission is build a friendly AI. That's us. There's like various things that we're also concerned with, like trying to get more eyes and more attention focused on the problem, trying to encourage other people to do work in this area. But at the core, the reasoning is someone has to do it. Someone is us. The Singularity is a, a phase change, if you like, in the rate of progress, a situation in which we are accelerating the advance of certain technologies so rapidly that the predictability of how things are going to look becomes not merely difficult in terms of time frames, but difficult qualitatively, difficult in terms of what this, what, what this technology and what our relation to it will look like when the technology arrives. The singularity has been given a lot of different definitions. The three major ones are um, accelerating change, the breakdown of the model that happens when we've got AIs running around that are smarter than we are, and um, the intelligence explosion, which is what happens if a smart mind can improve itself and make itself even smarter and improve itself even further, lather, rinse, repeat. The thing is that we don't know how to really achieve smarter than human intelligence, and therefore there's a lot of thinking that's gone into this that tells us that we will do it only by developing what are called recursively self-improving systems. Systems that are un understand them themselves, understand their own workings well enough to be able to actually automatically implement improvements to their own functionality. What we're doing right now is focusing on mathematical and theoretical research, looking at the, some of the underlying questions related to whether friendly AI what we call friendly AI is even possible. In very broad terms, the research program has two phases, which is figure out what to do and do it. Right now, for example, we're looking at reflectivity, which is that humans seem to get a tremendous amount of mileage out of thinking about thinking. You know, modern AI programs do not seem to get any significant mileage out of this, and therefore humans are doing something important and useful, and we do not currently know what it is. And we're trying to get that problem set up and knocked down. It certainly has been predicted in the 1980s. People were saying it was you know, right around the corner. And it's, it certainly has taken longer than many disappointments on the way to, uh, to sort of generalized AI. But, uh, but cl it's clear that there's a massive set of, of, of issues that are happening. And, uh, and you know, people who don't think that there is something important going on are, are just living in a delusional fantasy world. Just because some people were wrong back in the 60s and 70s doesn't necessarily mean that a particular technological achievement can't be done in the year 2007 or 2010. It's very hard to know whether we're early or late in this process, or you know, maybe, maybe AI never happens for some strange reason we don't understand yet. The obstacle to creating strong AI and smarter than human intelligence is a piece of knowledge. And it's very hard to predict when you're going to get a piece of knowledge you don't have. Obviously, if there is a way to prepare for this, uh, it behooves us to do it now. Uh, and that is part of the goal of both Foresight and the Singularity Institute. The real big deal about the Singularity is the negative side rather than the positive side. The possibility that when we develop, if we develop, these machines that are recursively self-improving and become extraordinarily intelligent very quickly indeed, they may not like us terribly much. They may decide that we are not very important. That would be a bad thing. So the question is, can we develop machines that can be recursively self-improving but which maintain themselves reliably within a sort of a space, a subset of potential machines of this sort that carry on thinking of human beings as important and indeed as very important as their main raison d'etre. I believe it's critical that these extremely powerful technological developments come to fruition first in the open societies, in the democracies. We don't want very powerful new technologies to be arising in places where, for example, 
democracy does not have a strong hold, has, uh, is perhaps relatively new or even non-existent. The thing I'm worried about is that it's going to take very deep understanding and very precise work to actually reach into mind space and pull out a helpful mind. And I'm worried that someone's going to underestimate the difficulty of this problem and proceed on a vague theory and get some exciting results and, encouraged by this, rush ahead and uh, doom us all. In terms of uh, the Singularity Institute and our mission, when we think about how to create a framework for uh, ethical artificial intelligence, how do, how do we go about doing that? And it's a tough question. And it really needs the input of a large group of people with different perspectives to give their insight. A critical step in the project of guiding artificial intelligence is the creation of a community of, pe of like-minded people who care about this goal and who bring important skill sets. So I'm a big supporter of the Singularity Summit and the other technical meetings that Singularity Institute will be having. We will have experts from you know, from biology, physics, security, cryptography, artificial intelligence, a wide range of fields, bringing them together for the first time and begin engaging in dialogue to have a wide spectrum of views. Singularity Institute, like any forward-thinking group, has to draw on a wide range of expertise. They've brought me in as an advisor because of the overlap between the experience and expertise that I have and what they need. My role for the Singularity Institute in my advisory capacity is to help them understand two key points. One is, what will be the connection between the development of artificial intelligence and the development of nanotechnology? And the other is a broader question, which is, how do you communicate and educate people about the longer-term technological future? Nanotechnology is about the future of the material world. Artificial intelligence is the future of the information world. So the Singularity Institute will create more events. The events will be separated into two categories of the more popular events of bringing together the, the larger number of peoples to just start thinking about these issues. And the other type of events will be the workshops, the technical conferences. A lot of the work going on in universities and governments today is focused on narrow artificial intelligence. We're focusing on general AI. There's very little focus in the government and universities today because they work within time frames that are very near term, two, five, maybe seven years, but certainly not 10, 15, 20 years. So that's why a nonprofit is important. You know, I think a lot of different people should care. I think uh, government actors should care. I think uh, corporate actors uh, should care. I think individual actors should, should care. Um, I, I do think that um, for a lot of structural reasons, it is very difficult to get, uh, you know, um, large, somewhat risk-averse organizations to invest in this kind of research. It is cutting edge. Some people would view it as, you know, beyond the pale of respectability. Um, from my experience, it is only by pushing things beyond the pale of respectability that you get things done and that you really move the dial. But I think that, based on my experience, getting individual donors to step up to the plate remains the, the, the best option in the near term. These organizations don't just spontaneously occur and just happen, they have to be supported by individuals that have that vision. So that's where, you know, it comes down to basically fundraising and every little bit of support really does have an impact on the day-to-day -day operations. Where people put their individual philanthropy dollars is always, it's always somewhat of a personal decision. Uh, I think people should look at the Singularity Institute very carefully and I, th I think that uh, it's done a phenomenal job over the last few years on a, on a shoestring budget. And uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, the, the key question is always, what's the amount of leverage you get as an investor? And where can a small amount make a very big difference? And I think this is, this is a very leveraged form of uh, philanthropy. The fact is, um, the long term is created every single day and is being created right now. So by uh, participating and investing and supporting the Singularity Institute, you can really, I think, rest assured that you are having an impact on the eventual future of humanity um, in a way that most other causes don't actually let you say that.